First World War would pale into insignificance when compared with the horrors of the Second World War. The Holocaust, the killing of six million Jews, killing of millions of other civilians, the atrocities of the Japanese prisoner of war camps, all these uh, were seen to be to have been perpetrated by three uh, dictatorial states with their fascist ideologies. This compared with the fact that all these three states were ultimately defeated in the Second World War made the explanation of the war quite simple at the beginning. For more than a decade, the orthodoxy was that the three fascist states with their radical uh, political ideologies caused the Second World War and subjected the world to untold misery and devastation. It was suggested that had Devil Chamberlain of Britain not pursued the policy of appeasement, had France been more resistant, had opinion in the USA been a little less isolationist, things might have turned out to be different. Indeed, there might not have been a war at all. This orthodoxy was supported by older historians like Sir Lewis Namia and Sir John Wheeler Bennett. They subscribed to this simple explanation. They were a little too judgmental. They in a way betrayed the general uh, feeling of Germanophobia that affected uh, most of the historians. A major breakthrough was achieved around 1961 when A.J.P. Taylor published his Origins of the Second World War. Taylor was provocative if also a little opinionated. He felt that Hitler's aims were no different from those of other statesmen. He also went on to suggest that Munich was a triumph of all that was best and most enlightened in British life, a triumph for those who had preached equal justice between peoples, a triumph for those who had courageously denounced the harshness and short-sightedness of Versailles. Again, I am, I am quoted from Taylor. Quite obviously, his views did not go unchallenged. Hugh Trevor Roper, who had worked in the, with the German secret files uh, at the end of the war, suggested that Taylor's thesis would do irreparable damage to his reputation as an historian. Trevor Roper, on the other hand, suggested that uh, Hitler did have a concrete plan of ultimately expanding in the East and finally at the cost of the Soviet Union, established domination over the whole of Europe, if not later extending it to the whole of the world. So Trevor Roper for one was convinced of Germany's guilt, particularly of Hitler's guilt. <laughs> The historians have broadly been uh, uh, divided into two different schools. The intentionalist school who did believe that Hitler and the Germans must share the responsibility for causing the war. They accept that whether Hitler had a plan or not, uh, there is uh, no doubt that it was his uh, dictatorial policy that was the determining factor. Uh, behind the German foreign policy during the Third Reich. Alan Bullock, for example, concluded that Hitler pursued a plan of German domination of Europe by establishing a new order. He identified the overthrow of the Versailles system and the pan-German dream of dominating Europe 
as the two primary aims of Hitler's foreign uh, policy. Taylor, as we have seen already, did not believe that Hitler had a plan. According to him, Hitler was a brilliant opportunist and uh, he even considered that the ideas uh, expressed by Hitler in the so-called Hossbach Memorandum were nothing more than mere daydreams. He, Hitler had a plan, he was only waiting upon events and responded to them. But even then, Hitler, Taylor did concede that Hitler had an expansionist dream in the, in the East. It was taken up later by German historians as well. Andreas Hillgruber, for example, suggested a three-stage plan that Hitler had undertaken. It was first Europe, then the Middle East, and finally a global war with USA for world domination. Klaus Hildebrand had also talked of a Stufen plan that again is a stage-by-stage -stage plan for expansion. For him, the stages were uh, first Lebensraum or living space in Eastern Europe, destruction of Soviet Union in the next stage, and finally global domination. Thus, Hitler's foreign policy, according to these historians, was the outcome of his own clear personal intention, executed with a high degree of tactical flexibility and improvisation. Later, other German historians like Everhard Jekyll and uh, Dietrich Eigner echoed uh, almost identical views. Jekyll argued that even a cursory glance at the diplomatic and military history of the Third Reich demonstrated that Hitler had a definite and structured list of objectives and priorities, uh, even if he did not have a timetable or a detailed prospectus. Some German historians have even suggested that Hitler's ultimate domination, uh, ultimate aim was the domination of the fortress Europa to begin with and then world domination by uh, achieving victory first over the Soviet Union and then extending the war beyond Europe. As against this, uh, intentionalist school was a structuralist or the functionalist school. They would argue that the policy of the Third Reich was dictated by the structure of the state and society and, and economy. They also further argued that policy decisions were determined by the functioning of the principal elements of that system or that structure. A number of studies uh, have now demonstrated the polycratic nature of the German dictatorship. Now, they, they, they suggest that the Nazi system was far from a monolithic, centralized and efficient dictatorship. It was an administrative anarchy of competing agencies. Hitler, for some, was even a weak dictator who, rather than initiating policy, responded to the pressures created uh, by the system. That is, pressures that uh, were created by this rather chaotic system of dictatorship and uh, coordination that the Third Reich had been able to achieve. Hans Mommsen, for example, argued that the foreign policy of the Third Reich had no established priorities. There was no plan. He concedes that it had expansionist dynamic, but no ultimate aim. Indeed, he has described the policy as expansion without object. Karl Dietrich Bracher in his book, The German Dictatorship, feels that the idea of Hitler as an all-powerful dictator is a myth which was perpetrated by Nazi propaganda. So, they would tend to argue that Hitler's 
total control is, is something uh, that was misread by historians earlier and needs to be uh, questioned uh, properly. Martin Brossett argued that Lebensraum was at best an ideological metaphor essential for the sustenance of the dynamic forces released by the Nazi movement. While these people were talking of the defects in the structure of the Third Reich, this was later carried on particularly to the economic field by another set of historians. <music> Tim Mason, for example, took the view that the war had begun in 1939 as the result of a domestic economic crisis uh, in Germany in the late 1930s. His conclusion was that the forced rearmament, for example, program that Germany had uh, undertaken intensified all the contradictions and difficulties within the system uh, that had really uh, left no other uh, option open for Germany. This is true of uh, events after 1936 when the four-year plan was uh, adopted and so to be executed. Uh, there were several problems threatening the economy. For example, inflation, budgetary difficulties, and the worldwide trade recession of 1937, which affected Germany's uh, trade possibilities and hence the import of uh, the required and absolutely essential raw materials. Because of these problems, he felt, that is Hitler felt, that war should come sooner rather than later. Now, this view is given credence by the fact that 1.5 million foreign workers and 1.3 million prisoners of war were working in, in Germany as cheap labor in June uh, 1930, 1941. Later, Jan Kershaw and Richard Overy have also uh, suggested uh, identical factors as the reason behind Hitler's decision to switch on the aggressive mode after, increasingly after 1936. Richard Overy in his book, War and Economy in the Third Reich, had examined in details the possibilities of uh, the domestic pressure uh, being manifest in the pursuit of a foreign policy. And uh, rearmament is, is always privileged as one of the factors that produced a tremendous pressure on the domestic economy and the rearmament was seen as, the, uh, as an adjunct of the aggressive foreign policy and Hitler's decision to ultimately wage a war. So here also, even though they, uh, the, 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 the points, uh, uh, he, he point is that it is the difficulty of the structure uh, or the contradiction of the structure that resulted in imbalances and, and led to war, the responsibility of, the, of Hitler could not be entirely negated. Another point was made later by, by many historians, in, including German historians, is a question of continuity in German foreign policy. Earlier, historians like Meineke uh, thought that the Nazis had no deep roots in German history. Gerhard Ritter, for example, suggested that features of Nazi foreign policy like uh, anti-Semitism and social Darwinism were imported from outside Germany. But more recently, uh, Taylor, for example, in his The Course of German History, had earlier suggested that there was uh, indeed a continuity in German foreign policy goals between 1871, the, the creation of the Second Reich till 1945 when Germany was defeated in the Second World War. Uh, Fra Fritz Fischer, the noted German historian who had uh, written about German responsibility in the First World War, had also seen this continuity in a later volume that was entitled From the Kaiserreich to the Third Reich. Here again, 
Fisher suggests a continuum between 1871 and the period of the Third uh, Reich there. And uh, historians, if we may sum up some of the points that they have suggested would be that Lebensraum, for example, had earlier echoes in the propaganda of the Pan-German League in the 1880s and 90s. German dominance of Eastern Europe, for example, was also a clear aim of German foreign policy in the First World War. The German Fatherland Party, created during the war by the army and army veterans, had identical views and membership as that of the Nazi party much later. Even the Weimar government between 1930 and 33 had advocated many basic goals of Hitler's foreign policy. Hitler in a way represented the right-wing consensus in German uh, society uh, over particularly the goals and aims in foreign policy. Yet it is to be considered that Hitler outdid all other governments in sheer wickedness, uh, particularly in the extermin extermination of the Jews. Jeff Ailey, another English historian, suggested that Nazism was indeed more extreme in every way. Mussolini had become close to Germany. We have seen this in an earlier lecture that particularly after the Italian invasion of Abyssinia, Mussolini increasingly leaned towards Germany and Hitler. Yet in 1939, he was neutral, joined the war only in 1940 after Hitler had virtually routed uh, France. Historians have doubted whether Mussolini had any foreign policy goals uh, at all, whether he had a very clear idea of what he wanted, apart from vague uh, uh, expansionism. He has been described by Max Smith, a notable historian of Italy, as a blundering boaster who lived in cloud cuckoo land and improvised his foreign policy almost daily." Unquote. Uh, recently, historians have tried to understand a kernel of policy in behind Hitler, uh, Mussolini's decisions. For example, he was also thinking in terms of a living space, Spazio Vitali, in uh, particularly North Africa and East Africa and maybe in the in Middle East or West Asia. He also needed the foreign policy adventures as a kind of safety valve to turn away the attention of people from the domestic pressures. But ultimately one has to concede that <coughs> Mussolini or Italy was a great power, a major power in Europe only by courtesy. Italy did not have the resources and the power to really take a decisive action in European politics, not yet. He however kept his options open and this is why he remained neutral in 1939 joining only 1940 when it l appeared likely that Germany would win this war. <music> Historians have turned away from uh, Hitler and the three fascist powers to also look at the at least negative role of the uh, West European powers, notably France and uh, Britain. <clears throat> it was first uh, suggested by a book entitled The Guilty Men. This was written by a group of left-wing intellectuals in England under the pseudonym of Cato and it was published as early as 1940. It viewed appeasement as a blatant surrender to the bullying of Adolf Hitler. Later, Wheeler Bennett, Kate Middlemass, uh, Martin Gilbert and R.A.C. Parker have all worked on this aspect of international politics in Europe during the 1930s. And they, you know, in a way reinvented the guilty men as men who were guilty of uh, pursuing a diplomacy of illusion. Uh, this allowed, in, this in fact had uh, allowed Hitler to feel encouraged. They, they never really resisted Hitler. Alternative policies like a positive commitment to France against German aggression, uh, attempt to bolster the League of Nations as a real agent of collective security, 
of cultivating friendship with uh, the Soviet Union had never been even seriously tried. And therefore, when war came, Britain and France were without friend, but more importantly, they were also in a weak military situation. Chamberlain was personally responsible for this policy of appeasement as he virtually ran the foreign policy as a one-man band. But with the opening of the archives in the 1960s, late 1960s, a revisionist view appeared on this question as well. It was argued that a set of domestic and international pressure, a set of economic and military factors made it impractical to stand up to the dictators. And a policy of peace was preferable. Secondly, the leaders were prisoners of circumstances beyond their control. Third, Chamberlain was a wise statesman who was trying to preserve Britain's status as a major power which he knew would be destroyed by a possible war. Finally, Britain did not have enough skilled manpower to fight a war uh, against Germany, Italy and Japan combined. Now, therefore, they would consider Chamberlain to be a realistic statesman rather than a fool or a coward. France was also put under the scanner and French policy of appeasement has been uh, criticized as well. It was suggested that France stumbled from government to government. She had 16 coalition governments between 1932 and 1940, from crisis to crisis and finally from peace to war. French appeasement was negative and stoical. They were, the, France's defense was entirely predicated on the Maginot line and they had no thinking about a, an offensive strategy at, at any point of time. And uh, in attenuation of France, only it's been said that France could hardly afford to alienate Britain and see her on the sideline in case of a war between France and Germany. But even then, the French appeasement was positive. Now, again, orthodox historiography would often put a, a sizable blame on the Treaty of Versailles, that the Versailles contained the seeds of the Second World War. Now, this view was first put forward in a manner of speaking by the brilliant economist J. M. Keynes. He wrote the economic consequences of the Peace of Versailles at the end of the year 1919. And in this, he argued that by keeping German economy dead, the peacemakers had decided to kill the European economy. He said that before the war, German economy and along with it, European economy had been rising all the time. And now, half the continent lay dead after the war and the other half was dying. In this context, he felt that the peace had become a Carthaginian peace. Instead, every effort should have been made not to alienate Germany at all. A.J.P. Taylor argued that the Treaty of Versailles lacked moral validity almost from the uh, beginning. But again, this view has not been accepted by others. Later, Ruth Hennig, uh, Antony Adam Thwait tried to suggest that they had done a uh, decent work. Probably they faced problems which could not be solved, which were very difficult to be solved. And that the, in the 20s, the peace, peace worked. In 30s, it did not work because there was no enforcement. That when the terms of the treaty were violated, those who were supposed to preserve the treaty did nothing to, to, to make the treaty enforceable. And it was the violation of the treaty, violent violations by Hitler and, and Mussolini that ultimately made the slide to the war unavoidable, uh, if not inevitable. The Great Depression of 1929-30 as a real watershed. The peace worked in the 20s, but it was not workable anymore because of the Great Depression. And the blame, therefore, should not be apportioned to the peacemakers of 1919. And the final point would be the role of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. 
because the Nazi Soviet pact provided the immediate backdrop to the Second World War, historians have also raised a, an accusing finger at Stalin that by concluding the Nazi Soviet pact, he had relieved Hitler of the nightmare of having to fight on two fronts. But then in, in, in support of Stalin, it was suggested that he had tried to, to make peace. Indeed, uh, during the Cold War period, uh, some American historians in particular, including Robert Tucker, suggested that the foreign policy of the Soviet Union in the 1930s deliberately wanted to drive a wedge uh, between the capitalist powers and, and expected that they would be involved in a war and the Soviet Union would benefit at the end of the war and make advances in Eastern Europe. As against this, when the archives, Soviet archives were opened after 1989, it has been seen that the Soviet Union did try to uh, support the collective security. They entered the league in 1934. After that, wanted to cultivate uh, uh, collective security. They wanted to support Czechoslovakia in 1938. They had, in, even in early 1939, tried to make friends with Britain and France rather than with Germany and finally concluded the pact with Germany as they did not have any option. Stalin had a sneaking suspicion that Britain and France were hell-bent in unleashing Germany and Hitler against the Soviet Union. And a final point about the American isolationism and its withdrawal from the League. It has been suggested that this made the League weak from the beginning and uh, did not give collective security much of a chance. And also the war in the Asia-Pacific region uh, was also important, particularly the role of Japan as an aggressive power. <clears throat> Uh, but we have not uh, looked at the uh, Asian uh, war at all. We have concentrated on Europe here. Now, then in conclusion, it is possible to suggest that the consensus on the origin of the Second World War and on the responsibility for the war is bound to prove elusive. Uh, it is not necessary, perhaps not even desirable, that we have a final and unanimous view. The debate goes on. But in conclusion, one is tempted to revert to the point one had made at the beginning uh, and suggest that the primary responsibility of Hitler cannot be ignored.